Morning, y'all. Good morning, y'all. Happy Mother's Day. It is a glorious day. You know, it, it's inconvenient not to be in our natural habitat, but it is so glorious to be outside because you can just look around and see all that God has done. If you got your mother nearby, you can look at her and see that uh, God is good and what God has done because mothers are fabulous. Without them, we wouldn't be here and I won't go into the rest of all of that, but uh, there's more to it than that. But moms are great and this is just a fabulous Mother's Day. This morning, my, my devotion is, is about mothers from the Word of God. Starting in uh, Proverbs 1, I mean right at the beginning, Proverbs 1. Starting in 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. For indeed, they are a graceful, a graceful wreath to your head and an ornament about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not comment. I mean, look where, where the word of the Lord put moms. It was right behind the word of the Lord. Dad said, you better listen up to mom because she's going to tell you how not to go wrong. We are so blessed to have moms because they just teach us things that guys could not. Can you imagine if God left it to guys to do nurturing and uh, empathy and care and cuddles? I'm thinking it wouldn't real, be real good. In John 19, 25, you know, we know Jesus held the family in very high regard in all matters. And it was like the last thing on his mind is before he checked out and went back to the Father. In John 19, 25, it says, Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Not only did Jesus hold his mother in high esteem, that it was one of the last things he worried about, of course his mother stood by him right to the very end. A lot of the guys scattered, didn't want to be associated with them, but what did mom do? She was with them to the very end. In Luke 2, 46, it says, Then after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both both listening to him and asking him questions, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astounded. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated like this? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And said to him, and said to them, Why is it you were looking for me? Did you not know I had to be in my father's house? Now, I don't know a whole lot of mothers who would like not miss their kids for three days on a caravan, but I think that was just the way they traveled at the time. But certainly you could tell that despite how much mom loves you, sometimes she has to chastise you for going astray and uh, getting lost. And if you've ever lost your kid, that's an experience when you look around and wonder if you left them on top of the car or in the grocery store or somewhere. I know we lost one of our kids once, left them at church, but it, was, it wasn't terribly exciting because we knew they were in a good place to be left. And, and right from the very beginning, in Exodus 20, 12, it says, Honor your father and your mother so your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord gives to you. And going to Proverbs 6, 20, My son, observe the commandments of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mothers. In Proverbs, Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever walked the earth other than Jesus and God himself, he, uh, he couldn't get off saying, listen to your mom because they're wise, they're loving, they're kind, and that is why we celebrate them on this special day. God bless mothers everywhere, those who have, who have passed on, those who are still with us, and uh, just appreciate your mother and take care of her in every way you can. Amen? Amen. I'll have a prayer. Dear God, we just thank you for for mothers, your, your plan is great. Your, your wisdom is just beyond understanding that you could create such a, a fine species of people that could raise people up, godly people, nurture them, take care of them, and do all the other things that mothers do. We thank you for being in this place this morning. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and for the salvation he brings to us through his death on the cross. All these things we ask you for and praise you for in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. All right, y'all got just, I, I think, like one announcement, and that's that we really have no announcements other than we're going to be out here for at least one more week because we can't quite figure out how to be safe in the space that we're in and it'd be a lot of logistics. So just continue to come out. I think next Sunday is supposed to be another glorious day and it's always a glorious day to hear the Word of God. Now, this will be the first Sunday, Mother's Day, that I can remember in I don't know how long. I think kind of like doing the children's sermon, someone would ask me, would, uh, can you hand out flowers on Mother's Day? And I've been doing it ever since, so it's, it's, been a, it's been a long time, so this Mother's Day is a little bit different to avoid contact. We're not doing flowers because we just thought that would be the wise thing to do. And you know that wisdom came from a mother. That was from my wife because me, I said, man, let's do it. She said, well, be wise. I said, okay. So anyway, moms are great. Wives are great. So we just got a couple observations to make on this Mother's Day from children. The question to the children was, how did God make mothers? And one reply was, magic plus superpowers and a lot of stirring. The reply from another was, he made mom just the same way he made me, he just used bigger parts. And, and yet, from another one, this is from a little girl, it said, he used dirt, just like he used for the rest of us. <laughs> that, that, I don't think that was theologically on, but uh, you know what, it was cute. <laughs> and, and another question to the kids was, why did God make mothers? I said, think about it. It was the best way to get more people. Another question put to the kids is, why did God give your mother, give you your mother and nobody else's? The answer was, God knew she likes me more than a lot of other kids' moms like me. And another question, what kind of little girl was your mother? One of the answers was, I don't know because I wasn't there, but my guess was she was pretty bossy. <laughs> and another answer was, they say she used to be nice. <laughs> and why did your mother marry your father? The answer was, she got too old to do anything else with him. <laughs> and my grandmother said that mommy didn't have her thinking cap on. Well, <laughs> you know what? Man, wives are great, moms are great. What would we do without them? We just thank you all for being here this morning, and uh, Brother Robin's going to bring us a fabulous word from the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. How many ch children of God do we have in the parking lot? <laughs> Amen. And, you know, it's kind of a morbid scripture, but Paul tells us that to die in Christ is gain. So there's nothing to be afraid of. There's no reason why we should be terrified of COVID or anything else, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about mamas here in a minute, but first of all, we're gonna talk, have some prayer requests. I don't know that I can hear y'all if y'all have one. Does anybody have one they wanna scream out? I know we got Doris, our Aunt Wink is family calls her still. My stepmother April just had a uh, surgery on a lung to have something removed. Okay. Again, stepmother April. Anybody else this morning? And I guess uh, I just was talking to Patty just a minute ago before we started. Everybody that works around people, and not all people are very intelligent at times, are they? But we all got to work with people and deal with people. But uh, that's part of being a Christian is being able to walk in those times and do the right things. But I guess there's no other prayer requests. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. But anyway, Father, we come to you this morning and. We are blessed to be children of God. We know that we are, that you walk with us and you walk through all the times in this life that are difficult. And we, and we deal with difficult people sometimes, Lord, and help us to, to not get angry and help us to wear our, our Jesus pretty well in those situations, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus is in our hearts and we thank you that he guides us and we thank you that the Holy Spirit tells us not to say those words we want to say sometimes. He tells us how to live and how to act and he keeps us on the narrow path. And Lord, just help us to realize that during these times more than ever, we need to be the best example of who Christ was on the earth. Not to be to argue with people, not to be, just to be there available for people is what we need to be. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We have people in our church like that and we just wish we could go out and see people and, and love on people like we used to. But for now, we just need to keep them in our thoughts and our prayers. Lord, just help us through this time. And, and there's, I worry about probably more than anybody else, those that struggle with loneliness, those that struggle with depression, because this is a hard time to be away from everybody. 
And I just ask you, Lord, to, to touch those folks and let them know that you love them and that you care for them. And I just hope that, that, you're all, that they understand how much you do. And Lord, bless our little church as we go forward into the future. No, 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 nobody knows what that's going to look like right at this moment, but I do, I do feel that God is moving and doing things as he always does, especially in spite of circumstances, because he is a Lord that does that. He's an overcomer. And he is, like I say always, the God of the circumstances. So he put us here for this moment at this time to do what we're supposed to do. And now I ask you to, to share in me and join in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm glad Ken kind of started us off on a humorous note. I uh, I don't normally do that for for the first probably three or four years that I preached. I stayed away from being humorous in the pulpit because it's my natural nature to be silly. And I didn't want people not to take the message of the cross anything less than serious. But today it's Mother's Day and I can be a little silly and we can have a little fun. I've been doing it 10 years now. And, Y'all know I got a good heart regardless of how silly I get. I, have, I really have two, two skills in life. I'm a comedian and a cook, and I don't know that those help me do much of anything, but I, uh, I'm glad to be here today, and it's a beautiful Mother's Day. And we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between men and women. It's a good time for the women to laugh because most of those difference, differences are positive to their side of the, the fence. But anyway, I'm going to start off with a scripture from Colossians 2, and it's verses... Two and three that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining all riches of full assurance and understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God both of the Father and of, of Christ in whom all are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge word of God for the people of God let us pray dear father we thank you for wisdom oftentimes we don't show much of it and oftentimes we don't act like Christians when we should and and today's message is a great message about a, a lady of God that just, she showed what a, a person should look like uh, that is a Christian, a mom, all the above. And, and it's a perfect person to, to bring out today uh, for this sermon for Mother's Day. And Lord, just help me to use, give the words that you need me to hear, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so a friend of mine is, a, and, y'all, and some of you know her, her name is uh, Terry Regal. And we were talking the other day about women of the Bible and and she brought up Abigail. And I said, you know what? Mother's Day is coming up, and I've never preached on Abigail. And I've flown right through there several times in Samuel. But that happened, that, that's in 1 Samuel 25. But I want to just... Uh, I, I did a little research, a little scientific research, which is dangerous for a man. Anyway, and uh, some differences between men and women. And I guess before I get started on this... Uh, this message today applies to those that are married, those that uh, are going to be married, all of the above. I mean, it's just one of those, it's, it's a good story, and, it, and, it's, and it's got some great biblical teachings, but it also points out blatantly how much men are different than women and, and the things that, that go on in that world. But I want to, uh, I've looked up this study about the difference between, and I, and I know some of you know the comedian that does the thing about men being left brain and, and women being right brain and calls her husband left brain. I'm not going to get into all that, but it's pretty funny stuff. But anyway, it says that uh, some of the research that I read said, upon entrance to school, the average girl simply is cognitively more ready for school tasks than the average boy of the same age. The male brain, though, is 10 to 15 percent larger and heavier than the female brain, and that men possess six times more gray matter. Now, why don't we have six times more gray matter and we don't know how to use it? I don't know. It's one of those things. But the, the thing I want to tell you about, uh, they did a study in 2006. I did this to be on the men's behalf. The rest of it's going to be on the women's behalf. But in 2006, they did a study, and it says that women say about 20,000 words a day and men say about 7,000. I'm just going to stop right there. That's just kind of one of those things that uh, my wife just stuck her tongue out at me right here on... Anyway, but this... This, this uh, doctor, Roger Sperry, uh, in 1981, he won the Nobel, Beast, Nobel Prize for uh, figuring out uh, some of this left brain right stuff. And 
and, and this is what you all need to know all your lives, everybody. He said, he determined that between 16 weeks and 26 weeks of gestation, the chemicals released in male babies that inhibit, inhibit their right brain growth. In other words, the side that has caring, not the side that has logic. So what he determined was that, that all men are born brain damaged. Just wanted to leave that with you so you'd know. And uh, you know, that's, that's where we'll start. I'm gonna give you some of the other facts just to get you on the point. So the female brain has 15% more blood flow. I guess we got less oxygen. Girls are less likely to have attention span problems and are able to transition between their lessons quicker. Girls' brains have naturally stronger connections that create better listening skills, better, stronger memory storage, and more developed discrimination among the tones of a voice. So boy, they can read when you're mad through your voice a whole lot better than a, than a man can. We don't get it. You scream at us, we still don't get it. Uh, it says that uh, a girl's corpus callosum is 25% larger than a boy's, and this allows for the two halves of the brain to go back and forth, and it makes girls good at multitasking. How many of us guys can do one thing and one thing only at a time? I mean, that's just, that's who we are. And then girls make Fewer impulsive decisions than boys do their higher serotonin level, and girls are less likely to taste risk. That's why we say, hey, y'all, watch this. That's where the guys, that's how we do that. But anyway, we'll start with that. That was just to give you an idea of the, the man versus woman thing. And I, and I thought it was awesome because, you know, we see that every day in life. But Ken brought up Proverbs uh, 1, verse 7. And what I want you to understand, what is, what is interesting is in Proverbs, when it starts talking about wisdom, when they talk about wisdom, and they continue to talk about it, they say she. They replace the word wisdom with she. They don't say he, they say she. So wisdom is a feminine quality, and I think that's quite interesting. But I'm gonna go on over to our story today. And I hate that we jump kind of back in time, but we went through this, this part of the Bible not very long ago, and I wanna tell you kind of with some, a great amount of background story, but so in chapter 25, it begins with, Then Samuel died, and the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him, and buried at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Okay, so if you remember David, and you remember what was going on in his life, Samuel was one of the greatest uh, leaders, prophets, all that, for the Israelites. And he was also a mentor to David, and he was the one who anointed David king. Now David did not immediately become king, and, and so he's kind of in a weird place because Saul, who's the old king, absolutely is jealous of him, hates him, wants to kill him, and is chasing him all over the countryside, especially now that Samuel has died. He is, he's, going to, he's going to take his revenge out on David, and David has had more than one chance to kill Saul, but he doesn't do it. And so we're going to get into our story here in a minute. I want you to understand that David is on the run. He's got 400 men. What's interesting about David's 400 men is they're kind of like the least of these. They're like the guys who didn't like the King, King Saul, didn't like his, his message, didn't like what he was doing, and he was kind of a bad guy. And, but they're kind of the poor outcast, and he, he's got these, these soldiers. And he's, right now he's running around with 400 of them, and they're hungry, and they're tired, and, and they're going across the wilderness and, and they run into this guy, and I'm gonna tell a story in just a second. But I want you to get a, uh, an idea of where David's mindset is when he meets this guy. And, um, and David is a typical male. He makes a decision, and especially if a man is hungry, that can cause some problems because we get a little grumpy and hangry is even worse. And, uh, and so that's kind of where the story is and we'll get started. But So now there was a man in Moan whose business was in Carmel and the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was swearing, and he was shearing, sorry, his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a good, a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But this man was harsh and evil in his doings, and he was the, of the house of Caleb. There's a lot said right there. Number one, there's nothing more dangerous than a pretty woman with a brain. I'm just telling you all that right now, guys. Because you're, 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 you're overmatched. I'm just going to tell you that. And so that's kind of where we are in this story. And, and Nabal, 
there is nothing in the Bible about Nabal that's positive. It's all negative. And it says that he was harsh and evil in his doings. And what's interesting is he was of the house of Caleb. Well, if you remember, Joshua and Caleb were the only two that got to come into the promised land. The only two that had faith in God. The only two that, you know, even Moses didn't make it into the promised land because he, 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 met, he, well, he messed up. He was disobedient to God. And so, so Caleb, he came from a good line. So you wonder what happened that he, he, he got so far away from where his grandfather was. You know, you wonder how kids are so different. But that's, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, he, he's just a bad guy. And so when David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to, and by the way, Nabal, when I say he was rich, he was Bill Gates rich for that time, kind of time. I mean, that, he was really wealthy. And when David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing the sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all you have. Now I've heard that your shearers, that you have shearers, and your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them, and all the while they were in Carmel. At, ask your younger men, and they will tell you. Therefore my, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever to your hand to your servants and to your son David. Okay, so, like I said, David's 400 men, they're fighting men, they're dangerous, and... They're not even, and David himself is famous. You have to understand, he killed Goliath. He slaughtered the Philistines. I mean, this guy is known. This guy is a grandson of Caleb, so he knows who David is, but it gets interesting in the story. He denies knowing who he is, but he actually, there's some little slips in what he says, so he does know who he is. And um, he's just a, an evil guy. He's a, he's a grumpy old man. He's a, he's a grumpy old fool is what he is. Actually, Nabal means fool. Now, why anybody would name their child fool, I have no idea. But, uh, so now if your husband starts acting up at home, you can just call him Nabal, just to, just to, to remember that from the sermon. But, but anyway, um, ask your young men, they will tell you, therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. You gotta realize when they share cheap, this is a big deal and there's a lot of money going around, a lot of food, and whatever comes to your hand and your servants to your son David. So when David's young men came and spoke to Nabal according to all the words of the name of David, and he waited, then Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? He knew who he was. He wouldn't have said son of Jesse had he not known. There are many servants nowadays who break away each from one of their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat and I have killed for my shears? and give them to men who I do not know where they are from. David's 400 soldiers had been protecting his flocks all this time in the wilderness. And, and the rule of thumb in those days was if a, if a traveler came to you, especially one who had been protecting your flocks, you fed them, you thanked them. That was just common courtesy. This guy didn't have any common courtesy in him whatsoever. He, he was just straight up evil. And so, and, and David is a traditional, a, a traditional male with a lot of testosterone, so what happens next is not very pretty. So David's young men turned on their heels and went back, and they came and told him all these words. And here's what he says. Then David said to his men, Every man gird on his sword. So every man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went with David, and 200 stayed with the supplies. So now one of the young men told... told told Abigail, Nabal's wife, something, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he, re and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us, and they did not hurt us, nor did they, we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in their fields. They were a wall to us both day and night, and all the time we were with them keeping their sheep. Now therefore know and consider what will you will do, for harm is determined against your master and against all his household, for he is such a scoundrel that no one can speak to him. So, among the men of Nabal or Nabal, they knew Abigail was somebody who had a brain. They knew she was fair. She, and, and we have some of these ladies in our church. They knew she was a peacekeeper. She knew she would try to work it out no matter what. And so he was wise enough to know that they didn't made David mad. He's got 400 men just went to battle not very long ago and slaughtered the Philistines. And he's coming and he's and he's angry and they said we need to go tell abigail because maybe she's smart enough to figure out what we can do if not we're all going to die 
everybody's gonna die. And so, then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seals of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, go on before me, see I'm coming after you, but she did not tell her husband, Nabal. Think about that for a minute. Here she is, this guy is angry, his warriors are hungry, they've done the right thing, they've taken care of these guys all this time, and here comes this lone woman with her servants and all this food. Now number one, that's a woman working on you right there. She's got the food together. She's going to go she's gonna make negotiations with food. And I'm sitting there thinking about how angry they probably are. And, you know, I just think about guys and how we think. And, and David said, we're still going to kill them probably. And the kids said, but man, she's got raisin cakes. <laughs> that's what he's probably saying. She's got raisin cakes, man. We're not going to, we're not going to kill them. We, we, don't kill her. And so it, it, it's kind of funny. But so it was as she rode on the donkey she went down under cover of the hill and there were David and his men coming down toward her and she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain I'll have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing has missed of all this that belongs to him and he has repaid me evil for good. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. In other words, he said, I'm gonna kill every man in that community, everyone. Now when David, Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, on me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. In other words, she didn't do anything wrong, but Lord, just, just put it on me. I, 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 I need to take this. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let my, my Lord regard, regard this scoundrel Nabal. So she called her own husband in the scoundrel. At least she was truthful. For as his name is, so is he. Like I said, Nabal means fool. Nabal, hang on, I found the lost one. Nabal is his name and folly is found with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord that whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present, present, which your maidservant has brought to you, my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. So she's telling him, who she, she knows who he is. She knows he's the future king. She's blessing him, basically saying she knows there's no evil in you, and she knows you're going to serve God all of your days. And yet a man has risen to pursue you and your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with your Lord your God. And in the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. That's a reference to the fact that he killed Goliath with a slingshot. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you. He has appointed you ruler over Israel. There will be no grief to, grief to you, nor offense to the heart of my Lord, either that you should have shed blood without cause, or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. So basically, she protected her household. She was a good wife. She stood up against an un, basically an oncoming army, and she did what was right, and she was smart, and she was beautiful, and, and she, she was a person who, who knew how to, to handle a very complex situation. And, and, and my title for this sermon was Kindness Under Pressure. She showed kindness when it just didn't make sense to show kindness to a lot of other people. She could have used her beauty and she could have messed with David's mind and say, well, I don't, I don't care about him anyway, you go kill him. But no, she defended her household, she stood her ground, and she, and she, she had Jesus type qualities. And you'll see this in the Old Testament because everything points to Jesus. She had that kindness in situations that, like Christ had. You know, Christ never lashed out against those who beat him. He never lashed out against those who tried to harm him. He just, he just walked his walk, and he was always kind and courteous no matter what. And so there's a lot to learn from her, from her persona and how she lived. And in verse 32 it says, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord of God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice, and blessed are you, 
are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging my own, myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, you who has kept me back from hurting you unless you had hurried and come to me, meet me, surely by morning light no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. So, so David began to understand, to be very honest, she was sent by God to prevent him from just doing meaningless bloodshed. Now I'm going to pick on the people in my church right now. Every husband here has gotten mad in a situation and at some point the wife has either talked him down or talked the other side down or got in the middle of it somehow and tried to make it right. Now sometimes we didn't like that as men. But God put women, women in our life for that reason. They, they are wise and they're, and they're kind. And sometimes we are strictly logical. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's good to be logical. But I think part of wisdom is, is having care and concern and knowledge, both. And we struggle a little bit with that time. So that's, it's a great message about what a mom looks like and what she can do. And that, now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was holding a feast in his house like a feast of a king. And one thing I want to go back before I forget. When, when he was describing what he had and why he wouldn't give it to David, he was using the word my. It was my wine, my bread, my stuff, my, 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 my. We have to all understand that everything that we have is God's. And you can tell from his mindset, he was selfish and he just didn't, he didn't want to share. It was what was his was his and he didn't care about anybody else. So I, I find that interesting as we get back to the story about what he's doing right now. This is what he's happening in his life. Now Abigail went to Nabal and there he was holding a feast in his house like a feast of a king. So he couldn't feed, he couldn't feed these men, but he's having a feast. But yet Abigail was able to throw together a whole bunch of snacks and show up out in the wilderness. So you can tell he's ultra wealthy if she can throw together that much food. And Nabal's heart was merry with him, for he was very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until the morning light. She was going to tell him what happened. But he was so drunk he couldn't comprehend. So it was that in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him. And he became like a stone. In other words, he had a stroke. He was so angry when he, when he woke up and she told him, he told her what she had done to keep the king from coming to kill him. She... Uh, he had a stroke. Then it happened that after about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. So he had a stroke and then 10 days later he died. I could ask the nurse about that, but she could probably tell me what happened. But anyway, you get it. You met, so the part I want to share with you in that, there are a lot of bad people in the world and there are a lot of people who are married to bad people. And, and what I want to show you was that, that Abigail was faithful to her marriage. She was faithful to how God wanted her to be, to be a mama and to protect her household and to do the right things. Isn't it interesting? Instead of turning David to where he would kill the problem, she honored her husband. She loved him. She did what she had to do, even though he was a scoundrel. And God, in God's way, rewarded her by taking him from this earth, getting him out of her, her life. And in just a minute, you're going to find out the rest of the story. And it's amazing that God, if, if you trust God, there's sometimes you wonder, why is that person married to that other person? I think God will fix it at some point if it's, it's truly it's His will for us to be happy. So in uh, verse 39, it says, So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord. That's the funniest line in the whole Bible. He heard he was dead. Thank you, God, he's dead. I mean, that, that's what he said. Blessed be the Lord. So he's so happy that the man is dead. That's terrible. He said, Blessed be the Lord who, who has pleaded the case of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. Now the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. And David sent and proposed to Abigail. So he saw how beautiful and smart she was, so he, he proposed to her and to take her as his wife. And the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel. They spoke to her saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. What do y'all think her answer was? After being married to Yahoo for all those years, now she's going to be married to a king. 
Then she arose, bowed her face to the earth, and said, Here is your maid servant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. So Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey, attended by five of her maidens. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Anima of Jezreel, and so both of those became his wives. But Saul had given Micah his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Lavish, who was from Gabion. Now I'm going to stop right there. So what a story. And, and I want you to try to think about this in your own world. You know, we, we have a lot of struggles in relationships. And we, and I, and I work with a person who has an expression I probably shouldn't even share. But it says that mean people suck. And uh, that's pretty true. I mean, it's one of those you don't want to deal with mean people. But we have to. We have to live and breathe and work in, in this world where people are mean. And we have to exhibit kindness under pressure, just like Jesus did and just like Abigail. And so I'm so proud of the mamas because mamas find it a whole lot easier to do that. And once they twist our arm, the men do pretty good too. But the whole story of Abigail is a story that's very Christ-like. She came to defend someone who was really awful someone who didn't deserve anything, but it was her place to love him. She was obedient to God. And the husband, on the other hand, was somebody who was totally disobedient. And, and actually, in, in the King James Version, it said he was a son of Belial. I mean, he was a son of the devil. He was somebody who just, just wasn't any good in him. And I know we've been around people like that. And, and, I, and, and I think, you know, in, in God's economy, Abigail was so faithful and doing the right thing and trying to make the best of any circumstance that God actually rewarded her by taking her problem away and blessing her with a new husband who would love her and cherish her. And, and I think you know, I think sometimes in life it's like that. I'm not saying it always goes like that, but I do believe that our God wants us to be happy and healthy in our relationships. And I, and I, and I feel for people who are caught in those situations, but you know, the best thing a person can do is pray for the other one. If you're, you know, if you pray for the other party in your marriage and you're having a little trouble, the prayer will change you. It may not change them, but it'll change you. And at some point, I do believe in answer prayer. I think God will step in and help you with whatever that situation might be. So that Abigail's a wonderful story of a mother. And that's our and, then, and that's our story for today. But she's also a story of who Christ is and how Christ always looked out for the He was always a peacekeeper. He always looked out for the best in people. He always tried to step in and, and, and guide people in the right ways, but he never backed down. That's the thing that I, I get a little aggravated. You know, we, we, we had the sermon on meekness a while back, and y'all really liked that because you, you understood after I showed you the illustration what meekness was. It's like a humongous, powerful horse that can do anything, absolutely just a war horse. But because you have the, the bit in your mouth of God's word and God's guidance, you don't unleash that power on people. In the case of Abigail, even she showed great meekness because believe it or not, she could have, with her beautiful feminine ways, have tricked David into killing everybody and got rid of her problem. But no, she did the right thing. She showed meekness. That's what we're to do. All of us are in situations where we have some power over another individual. We need to serve God and serve those people in ways that they understand that, that we are meek. It doesn't mean humble in the sense of uh, you know, people want to think meek means that you're weak. No. Meek is the ultimate strength. It means that you could, but you choose not to because you prefer to serve God and do the right thing. Amen? Let us pray. And dear Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for a message that was a little bit lighter than usual for me, and, and I get that, but I'm just so proud that we have mothers that are peacekeepers. We all had a mother that raised us and loved on us, I hope, at some point. We, I guess I shouldn't say that. There are some that didn't. But I know I'm blessed that I had a mom that loved me. And, you know, we were, at points she was a single mom and it was hard, but she still did all the things that she had to do and, and took care of me and, and provided for me. And, and I'm just so thankful that, that I was raised and, and had a, somebody that looked after me and cared about me. And all of us, many of us today, don't have our moms anymore and we miss them. And, Lord, be with those today that have the that are that are just having loneliness and, and miss their mom. Lord, be with them, and for all of those others out there that, that that are angry with their spouse or angry with their mom or angry with their dad or whatever their situation is. Lord, ask you to be the peacekeeper. Let the Holy Spirit work on everybody involved in that situation and bring them back together. 
There's no better time than today to come back together as a family. And there's no better time than today to come to know Jesus Christ. And I just ask you, Lord, that you would let the Holy Spirit continue to work on this little group of people here today. And that when we leave here today, that we would understand how much he loves us and how much he cares for us. And how much of a responsibility we have to live like Christ in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. I got one more closing song here. Look to all the brain damaged, grumpy old men in the crowd. Every once in a while we need to have an Abigail moment. We need to listen to that better half and do like David and, and turn away from our wrath. I, uh, I thought it was very interesting to read that and learn about her. And She only has a few, well, really one chapter in all of Scripture, but boy did she set an example of what it looks like to be someone who is doesn't back down from a situation. It takes a lot of nerve to take take your donkey and load up and go and ride into 400 battle-ready men. That's pretty amazing. And I, I think that's no different than a mom today dealing with the problems of this world and all that we have to show up and, 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 and stand up for what we believe and things that are going wrong. We need to be strong in our faith and, and be polite, show kindness, but, but be Christian in all that we do. Um, as y'all go away from here this week, I hope you have a blessed week. We'll just try this again next week, and uh, I'll take about a thousand more of these days. Everybody honk if you take another thousand days like today. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time here this morning. We thank you for blessing us with yet another wonderful, beautiful day. Lord, we, we, we don't even know. We are so blessed, and, and we, we struggle at times to understand all that you've done for us and all that you do for us and how you protect us day in and day out. Um, we, we are honored, Lord, and we are humbled, and we just ask you, Lord, to help us to take that from here as we leave and know that you are with us, know that you want to be with us and walk with us and guide us, and let our hearts be open to those in need right now. Let us be our hearts be open to those who are struggling with all of the change in strange circumstances lord and, and help us not to be angry with those who are being lightened the ball they're just being downright rude or mean or hateful or whatever help us to be take the higher hand and just and try not to to, to uh, respond in the wrong ways lord give us the peace and the hope and the joy that it takes to do that through you in jesus name amen <laughs>